Evening, everyone. I'm just I'm just muting everyone, um, and I'm pinning myself. And then we're obviously live on Facebook as well on our Facebook group. <clears throat> so I'll try and start bang on time. I'm still letting people in um, as we go, so I'll just give it another minute while I add these people in. Hope all of you are well tonight. I'm going to try and attempt to keep an eye on the Zoom chat and the Facebook chat. So. Might be a little bit of a challenge, but I'll, I'll do my best because I'm going to share a fair few sessions with you tonight as well to give you some examples of the type of practices you might want to be trying to put on or, or having a go at or looking at. Um, and that normally throws up a few questions, so which which is absolutely great. So I will uh, I'll make sure I try and keep an eye on both the chat functions as best I can. Um, <clears throat> right, I'll crack straight on. Um, so moving on to the UA for C course. So this is for coaches who have finished the old level one or who are have done the new introduction to coaching football. Um, I've delivered both of those. So obviously there's quite a lot of changes. Um, the first thing, unfortunately, I know some of the questions I'll get are, is when can I book onto a course? Um, I don't have the answers to that, especially for each county. Um, but if you go to your local FA, hopefully they'll have some answers. Um, I know down in Kent, where I am based, they are about to release the courses for next year. Uh, and there is going to be a fair few courses put on down in Kent. So hopefully it will start clearing that backlog. Because I know coaches are desperate to do the qualification. Um, and I can understand the frustrations with that. So hopefully everyone here gets on, a, gets on one soon and everyone can start progressing. So some of you, so a quick agenda. Uh, I'll do a quick introduction <clears throat> to myself, which if you've done the last webinar, sorry, will be a repeat. Uh, and if anyone knows me, it will be something they already know. Then we'll do a little bit about what the course covers. We're going to go on and discuss understanding your players. <clears throat> We're then going to do a little bit about the principles of play. And once we've done about the principles of play, we're then going to try and link that to a number of sessions. So I think I've got seven or so different sessions and I go through them one by one to give some, hopefully some ideas of the kind of practices you should be putting on at this level um, once you get onto your A for C. So, and then after that, we'll have a little bit of time for questions. What will happen is, for the first part, the introduction, what does the course cover, understanding your players, I'll kind of rattle through the slides and I'll have a quick break after that to catch up on any questions. So if you do have any questions, put them in the chat as I'm talking, and then I will get to them. Um, please be comfortable with just asking any questions you want. I'll do my best to answer it. And then after that, we'll go on to the principles of play in the sessions. When I'm going through the sessions, just ask questions as they're going on and I'll answer them. So otherwise we'll get a bit lost about what sessions we're talking about. Okay, so nice and quickly then, um, about myself, for those that don't know, I've coached at Grassroots Academy and semi-professional level since 2006. Um, I'm an A-licensed coach. I tutor the introduction to coaching football, UA for C and UA for B license. Um, I run my own sports coaching company called TSC, which was set up in 2011, um, mainly based throughout Kent at the moment, because we're expanding through uh, franchising. And we offer specialist coaching sessions in football, rugby, et cetera, as well as a schools program, community program. So that's just a little bit of a background about me. Um, but I'll skip straight into um, a lot of the discussion. So what does the course cover? So first of all, this, these are the types of things you'll go through during the course. And it's something that you can start thinking about now to preempt some of the thoughts you might have uh, and prepare you for when you go onto the course. So there will be a lot of stuff about understanding and adapting to the needs of your players. So it's not about coaching just under sevens. It might be about coaching under sixes, it might be coaching adults female players, male players, disability players. It's about what are the needs of your players? And we'll go quite in depth normally about analyzing this. So one of the first things, the most important things, and something we should all do is actually ask our players why they play. Um, most coaches, to be fair, haven't asked them all individually about why they play. You, some people are surprised by the answers they get. And then it's looking at that and going, all right, how do I need to adapt my approach based on what the players want? We'll go a bit more detail in that later. Um, and then analysing each player as an individual. 
and I'm going to give you an example of a player profile which will help you analyze your players. So that is one part of it. Second part is the different types of practices. So you might have um, outnumbered practices, practices where they're matched up. Um, we have um, practices that are uh, continual. We have practices, so that might be continual skill type practice where you're working on something really technical. And then we'll build that up to practices that involve a lot more decision making. So we'll have constant practices, we'll have variable practices. We'll do a lot of stuff on something called whole part whole, which shows you a way of coaching the game first and then breaking that down into a different skill and then going back into the game to try and implement it. So it's understanding different types of practice, what outcomes you get from each one. There's no such thing as a perfect practice. So some of them will, there's always a trade off on what you're doing. Okay, so it's understanding what the trade off is of certain types of practice. So the how to review your sessions. So it's about analyzing your own sessions and then taking input in from other coaches. So it's, it's sometimes quite a difficult thing to deliver on course and have everyone analyze you, but it's really important to do that. Um, and it needs to be constructive as well. So the four things we look at when we're analyzing our own sessions, and I still use this, this method, uh, and it's something you might get introduced to on course is, analyzing what were the session objectives and were they achieved? What was the player engagement? Was that achieved? If not, why not? If it was, it was achieved, why, did it, why was it achieved? How was the practice design that you've set out? Good parts and bits that can be improved. And what were your coach behaviours like? And what were the effects of your coach behaviours on the players? So the other thing about this is they all interlink. So if player engagement is low, it might not be because the players aren't behaving. It might be because the practice design isn't involving all the players or challenging them well. Okay, it might be that the coach behaviours are affecting the player engagement. So if they're actually in a positive way, the coach might be really positive, really encouraging to players, um, always giving them positive feedback and saying, this is something so-and-so has done well, who else can try and do that, might engage the players more. So it's about how these four areas all interlink with each other, because they all affect each other. Um, a big part of the course is how to create skillful players. So the question is, what is a skillful player? That's a, that's a question that if someone wants to chuck something in the chat, what is their opinion on what a skillful player is? And you can chuck that in the chat on Facebook or Zoom and then I'll try and come back to it later. Um, so how to create skillful players and how do we then create sessions and an environment to allow those players to become more skillful? There's stuff about match days, about your coach behaviours, how you manage difference and managing difference is a, a massive topic. So if you've got players that are really excelling at that moment in time and some that might be struggling. How do you manage that? And how can you use challenges? And then also, as you can see lastly, how to manage difference in um, your training sessions as well. So for anyone that watched the last webinar I've done on coaching under six, sevens and eights players, if you revisit that, there's actually a part about managing difference that is appropriate for all age groups, talking about the step principle and how important that is and how we can use it. So if you want to revisit that, you can go back to that webinar and that's, that's important for every age group, not just those young players. Okay, <clears throat> so understanding your players. And here's a couple of kind of things that you might start thinking about already uh, and start preparing for, the, for when you get onto the course. The first thing is why do they play, as I've mentioned. So we, do we really understand why they play football? Have you asked your players? Okay, it's massively important. Have you asked your players why they play? Especially coming out of COVID, uh, a lot of people's opinions changed on why they play football. And in grassroots, once you do that, it's your job as a coach to adapt around your players' needs. So if they play for social reasons and for fun, you've got to think about, well, if I'm coaching to try and be really competitive and win, actually, is that what they want? Um, and where's the balance of, of things? But also I'll put a note in here, adult level might be different. So if you're looking at actually, you are coaching, because we get people on the C license who are coaching at a competitive level of adult football. Um, so if you don't win, you're gonna, you're gonna lose your job. Um, so that means you need players that are kind of aligned with, why do they play? 
you want some form of competitiveness to be in their answer. Thanks, Andy. That's a great show. Great question, uh, comment as well about skillful players. I've chucked, uh, I'll park that until I come to the questions. So everyone else, can you put in um, what you think a skillful player might be? You can do that on Facebook or Zoom. Um, so, yeah, if you're an adult and coaching adults, you might need to win. So why do they play? Well, hopefully be to win. Some of it might, they might be quite clear and say, well, I do it to earn money. Um, and actually, there's nothing wrong with that as long as their work rate and effort aligns with what you expect. So four corner analysis, analyze your players in all four corners in and out of possession. This also needs to relate to your way of playing and style. Another great thing to do this is get the players to do that themselves. So I'll show you a profile in a, in a second. What do they need as individuals? So once you've analyzed them in the four corners, what do they need as individuals to help them develop? And then it's going more in depth. Well, how do you communicate to them? Because I can guarantee you've all got one player that you can't talk to the same as another player. You've got to adapt your approach to each player. And that's part of coaching. Okay? And also, what types of training do they enjoy and what challenges them the most and what do they get the most from? So these are all the types of things you've got to start considering around your players. And then finally, what do they need for their age? What works best for them? Is it a long-term project? So if it is, what is appropriate at this age? How, do they, how does this age learn? How much information can they retain? So here's my example. If we're teaching 1v1 defending, the first thing we teach is get in quick and then slow down. So big strides and then small strides as you get close to the player to put pressure on them. That is probably all I would talk to a six and seven year old about. Then once they get to under eight, I will start talking to them. When you get there, get side on and bend your knees. And for that age, we'd say like be a surfer. Okay, so side on, bend your knees. Okay, once they get to nine, 10, we'll then start to talk about, well, what foot are you showing them on? Left foot or right foot? Or are you showing them towards or away from the goal? And all we do then is teach them a little bit of alignment about, if I want to show someone that way, I'll get on the outs, I'll be in line with the outside of their upper shoulder. And also I'll then start teaching, don't always come for the big smash tackle, prod, so jab at the ball with your front foot, because then you can recover if the ball goes past you and move. So I wouldn't be teaching the bits about shoulder alignment and getting on the outside of their shoulder to show them one way to a, a seven or eight year old. I would to a 10, 11 year old. But if I haven't taught them at seven and eight to slow down once they get there to do big strides and little strides, it's going to be harder for me to implement that bit when they're older. So when I talk about a long term project, it's what stage are they at and what do they need now? So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so here's an example of a player profile. I've only filled a little bit of it in. I haven't filled out the whole thing. If you want to take this as a kind of template and start already doing this for your players, it will give you a head start. So this is obviously a fictional character, Barry Scott. Some of you will know who Barry Scott is. Um, age 13, the birth month of September. If anyone knows why birth month is important and why I put that in there, um, chuck a little comment about it. Their favoured positions, their football age, which is how long they've been playing football for, uh, and the reasons they play. They want to be challenged and improve, and the social reasons are they want to play with their friends. So then I analysed them in in possession and out of possession. I probably, if I was doing this for players, I wouldn't use red, I'd use orange, because red sounds like it's something you're, you're not very good at. I'd use orange for it <coughs> to show something they're improving at or developing on. So in terms of the technical tactical corner, uh, Barry can use both feet to finish and has got a good understanding of when to come short or go long. Okay, so Barry is obviously like, as, as you see in position, is my strike, one of my strikers. He's not confident in heading the ball and his timing of runs is off. He gets caught offside sometimes. So that's two, thing he does, two things he does really well, two things that he's developing and needs to work on. In the middle, we have transition. So when we win the ball, and you can see that I've been a bit lazy here and I've not filled the information out right. So I'll change that later before I send it out. So it might be in transition when they win the ball, um, always tries to play forward quickly. Okay? Or it might be when we win the ball, is slow to react as an area to develop on. Um, and when we lose the ball, similar things. So out of possession, angles runs well in the initial press. So they might use good angles of, of their run to cut out their pass. 
uh, and a good ability to show attackers a certain way. They have tendency though to tackle with the wrong foot and they can press at the wrong moments. So this will be starting to build a profile for one player. I will then add the different corners in. You're coming up with eight things they do well in possession, eight things they do well out of possession. And you'll come up with eight things they can improve in possession and out of possession as well as in transition. Great stuff, Andy. Thanks for that. Um, so those players born in September expected, and that's a great word, they're expected to have done more growing players in July and August and be more mature. It's not always the case. It's not a black and white rule of they're born earlier, so they're physically more developed because they do have different, they do develop at different pathways. But in general, if you think about it, well, someone born in September has got 11 months growth and development on someone born the previous, uh, in the July and August at the end of the school year. So they can have nearly a whole year. And that's not just development of them physically, that's their brain development. And the younger that players are, you start, you tend to see that gap quite big um, in some. And the players that are in the last webinar where I mentioned about under sevens and eights players that really dominate, it's not normally because they're tactically or technically better players, they're just physically more developed. That doesn't even mean they're bigger. It might mean their agility, balance and coordination is more refined. So it's just having an understanding of these things and then how we challenge them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So any questions, just chuck in the chat and I will answer them quickly. Otherwise, I will move on. Um, so in terms of, got this comment as well about uh, skillful players. So we have, um, if you ask your players, they'll say Messi or Ronaldo, but skill can come from everything, be that defending like Van Dyke, someone with vision and craft of De Bruyne or the ability to go people like uh, Past people like Messi. Okay, so yeah, that, and that's a perfect answer. So a lot of the times when we're asking younger players what skill is, they'll reference or relate to kind of take on and dribbling moves. But skill is such a bigger thing than that. So the defensive side of skill, time in your tackle, understanding how where to position yourself so you can be able to intercept. Okay, on the ball, that vision to play that pass, their finishing ability. Uh, their ability to manipulate the ball in different ways with both feet. So skill is a wide variety of, of things, and that's what will happen on the course. It'll be how do you develop all of these things during your practices, but challenging the individuals within that practice on what they need to work on. So here I might design a practice that makes Barry, and we're working on possession-based possession and trying to play forward and penetrate, which I'll show you some examples of later. But within that session, I might start giving Barry a challenge on the timing of his runs, or I might give him some extra attention when I'm coaching on the time of those runs. So if I relate this back to what are they like as a person, if Barry is a young player that doesn't like attention and doesn't like being coached in front of the whole group because they find it quite intimidating, my approach as a coach might be, oh, I'm going to do drive-bys with Barry which means I will just kind of, while the game's going on, while the practice is going on, I will pass and have a quick word. Well, right, well, think about the timing of your run there. When you see that someone's got their, got their head down, don't make your run yet, but when they get their head up, that means they can see you and where you're about to make your run. So when they get their head up, then try making your run. And I might do that as I walk past that player, and that's taking all of the player's needs into account. Um, so, yeah, that's... That's what we would do that. Cheers, Darren, for, um, <laughs> for your Barry Scott comment. Um, Darren is a very good coach. I know that I've worked with for a long time. So please feel free as well to ask Darren any questions that, that might come up. Um, so moving on from this, I'm gonna go a little bit into principles of play. So what we get asked a lot on course, it's about that transition from five aside to seven aside to nine aside to 11 aside. If you get the principles of play right, it doesn't matter what format you are playing. So these are the things you need to concentrate on. So in possession and out of possession. So in possession, we have penetration, creating space, movement, support, and creativity. These should happen in any match and they should be happening in your sessions and your practices. 
because your practices need to look game related. So first of all, penetration is our first priority. We're trying to break lines and move up the pitch, but with a focus on accuracy, timing and deception. It's not just about smashing the ball up the pitch. It's about playing the ball up the pitch in a controlled manner. Ultimately, that's what we're trying to do is trying to penetrate. So for me, that's the number one principle. So in your practice, there needs to be some opportunities to penetrate or we need to create opportunities to penetrate. Next is creating space. So if we can't penetrate and play a pass through or drive through, can we create space? So can we create width and can we create depth? And that will allow you to create opportunities to penetrate. If you've created that space and you still can't penetrate, now can you have some movement from individual players to create space for themselves or create opportunities to then penetrate and play forward. So this is also giving you a kind of structure of how you coach the session, especially in possession. Support, so providing options for the player in possession, around and away from the ball. So we don't want this all going towards the ball. Actually, the clever players sometimes stay away from the ball. Uh, and then finally, if we're still not able to penetrate, some creativity needs to come in. So it might be some individual skill to take the opponent out of the game and then create opportunities to advance. So that's the kind of way I look at this as like a flow chart. Can we penetrate? Yes, do it. If the answer is no, right, let's get width and depth. Now can we penetrate? If the answer is still no, right, let's have some individual movement. Now can we penetrate? If not, think about our support in and around the ball. So you might have to go back to go round. And now if we still can't penetrate because they're too organized and they're sat in a low block, can someone be creative? Can someone do that bit of individual skill or brilliance to allow us to get through? So this is what your sessions need to include, okay? Now there's very loads of different topics around these, which I'll come on to, um, but these are the principles of play in possession. The principles are played out of possession. So we've got press, so that's pressing the ball individually and as a collective unit. The idea is to cut out passing options and dictate where the opponents play. Also, by pressing, especially if it's high up the pitch, will allow a quick counterattack. So slow down the opposition. So delay, this is where we have to slow down the opposition in order to allow you to find your defensive shape. After that, we've got cover and balance, which is about providing cover for the pressing player. There's no point someone pressing by themselves. Okay, we need to provide cover for the pressing player as well as create a solid structure behind the ball. Okay. Compactness, um, this is our work in units and as a team to reduce space for the opposition to penetrate and operate in. If I ever work with grassroots teams, and sometimes I get asked to go and help grassroots teams out that are taking a bit of a pounding every week, because you do see it, they're getting 10, 12, 15 nils every week. The first thing I do is get them compact when they haven't got the ball. And being 10 yards from your mate, and everyone being 10 yards from their mate, all of a sudden, they, they start to look a lot better and a lot more organized. And then they'll start to get a bit more success. The confidence grows and you can work on other things. And then control on restraint is about being composed and patient and adapting to the defensive priorities in the situation that you're in. So if you think these are the principles of play, pressing might be pressing high up the pitch and trying to win the ball. It might be allowing the opponents to play into midfield and then we press aggressively in there. It might be about how we've, if we do get um, play against teams that lose, use a lot of width, once they get wide, how do we press them while they're wide to stop them either getting the crossing or playing centrally? So it's not just as simple as, oh, let's do pressing. What is the scenario and situation you're in and you want to practice pressing on? If there's any questions, uh, chuck them on. Um, I'm just going to start moving on to the sessions. Um, with the sessions, if you have a question about the session I'm going to talk about, just chuck it in the chat straight away so we don't get lost. Okay, and I will, those that email me after the uh, webinar, in the next couple of days, I will get this email out to you with the sessions. So I'll, I'm happy to send these sessions out as well. So <clears throat> for me, every session should, and on course, you need to start looking at sessions that involve the principles of play. They have to involve the principles of play, and it probably will just be one of them, although all the other principles will naturally come out if it looks like the game. And that is the narrowed down focus topic. 
So not just I'm working on pressing, but I'm working on pressing high up the pitch so we can win the ball early. Um, they need to be appropriate for your players and you need to make sure the area size is appropriate so it challenges the players and it's realistic to what they would play in. And then that ultimate one of be game related. So every time you're doing a practice, ask yourself, does this look like the game? So we don't do any, personally, don't do any dribbling in and around cones or using cones as traffic because that doesn't look like the game. Your opposition in a game is moving. Okay, now there's ways you can limit the players that are moving to allow players to get success, but we need that um, stimulus of seeing someone and their movements to decide what we do. So that's why we don't use cones because it doesn't look like the game in terms of dribbling in and out of cones. Um, so the following sessions are gonna show how you can focus on the principles of play and they can be narrowed down to, a, to narrow down your focus topic, which, these will just give you some examples. So hopefully they're quite useful. The big thing about coaching sessions, you don't have to be complicated. Keep it simple, okay? It's easier for the players when they're simple. It's easier for the coach. And then the skill of the coach is in a simple practice is knowing when to step in and what information to give. So you don't have to do really complicated practices or sessions. The simpler, the better. So first one is based around penetration. So as you can see, I've split the pitch here into four sections. I use a red set of cones in the middle just so you can see it, otherwise it might look like squares. But four sections here. So create a pitch the realistic size for the amount of players you have for their age, and then split it, I don't know why I put first, split it into cores. Have equal teams, or if, you, if you've got kind of 15 players, just give one team the overload. You don't want to have a floater in this one because it will mess up the way you're trying to play. Both teams play a match as normal. All rules are normal for that age. If you have offsides, they can only be offside in the final quarter because that allows us to just get a little bit of depth in the practice. This is important. You'll hear me repeat this constantly for nearly every practice I do. Players are not restricted to their zones. So if you go back to that part about player engagement, normally if players are restricted into a zone, straight away you see their engagement go down. So they're not restricted to their zones, they're just there as a guideline for the point system. Now, what we're trying to do through this practice is, uh, if you go to the first point, coaching point, can your first thought be, can I play forward? That's where they can just look to the next zone. So always look to see if you can at least play into the next zone is one thing you might just say to your players. But then we put this rule in. If a team plays forward and it misses out a quarter, there's a lot of thirds in here when it's in quarters, um, and it misses out a quarter, and then the team go on to score, it's worth three goals. So what we're trying to do is get them to get their head up and penetrate forward. So it's not about the ball coming here and just playing this easy pass in there. Actually, if you can play a pass to this player on their safe side, two zones up, that's better. So penetration, we kind of say the best furthest forward pass that you can play. So the furthest forward pass this goalkeeper can play is this striker. But is it the best pass? Probably not, because you're going to play it long and lofty. It's going to create a 50-50. But actually, for me, if this goalkeeper can play up to the right fullback, right in front of their feet, that's probably at this moment in time the best furthest forward pass or this midfielder that's just dropped off. What might happen, and I've preempted it in the instructions, is they do start smashing it and just smashing it forward all the time. So going, well, you say, I want to skip the zones out. And if they're, the argument is actually, if it's been successful for them, fair enough. But I, at this point, might put in a rule of you're not allowed to play overhead height because that actually encourages them to look for passes that are penetrating on the floor. So they'll start looking for gaps between the defenders. These blues should start making runs between defenders or a little bit higher up the pitch. And then the skills of coaches thinking about, so if we go back to another principle play, support, if this player is under pressure and everyone's two or three quarters up ahead the pitch, that's not the right level of support. So if the player is under pressure, the way I summarize support for all players to make it nice and simple, if the player on the ball is under pressure, you need to make a movement to support them so they can make a pass at an angle. So if they're under pressure, go and support. 
if the player on the ball is under no pressure, then you can make a run forward. So it's as simple as that. If they're under pressure, go support. If they're not under pressure, make a run. And that's it. That's it. You don't need to give players any more than that. So the coaching points we're using here is, can your first thought be, can I play forward? Because a lot of it with penetration might be psychological. Adjust body shape to be able to see the big picture. So that means when you receive the ball, can you see both sides of the pitch if you're receiving it or coming across you to switch play? Can you see where it's coming from, where it's going, and both sides of the pitch? If you're receiving the ball straight off the goalkeeper, I'd be asking, can your body be in a position you can see both goals? So that's opening your body to see the big picture. Can we get width and depth as a team? Because that will create more opportunities to play a penetrating pass. And then it's about the weight of pass. So the next person can do what they want to do with the ball and the quality of pass. So everyone does these little passes where people will fizz a ball in and because it technically looks really good, they say, oh, that's a good pass. It's only a good pass if the next person can do what they want to do with the ball. So if they can't do what they want to do with the ball, is it a good pass? So that's something for me about what quality of pass means, if anyone asks. Now, a simplified version of penetration. Nice and easy. Create an area size appropriate for your players, age group, and the amount of players you have. I would do no more than 4v4 in the middle. So if you start to get 12 players, I'd have two lots of 2v2 in the middle with servers on each one. Um, if you start to get um, 16, then you can do uh, 4v4 and a 3v3. So because you've got the servers, or it might be two 3v3, sorry, with two servers. Uh, and this is nice and simple. Two players going on the outside the box as target players with bibs on. The idea is to get the ball from one target player to the other 10 times. Doesn't have to be in a row. Okay, so if they lose the ball and then they're on five, they start back from five the next time. Uh, and I like to make everything competitive. I don't like to do it necessarily for like, we'll play for two minutes and then swap. I like to play to a score because that adds a psychological challenge onto the players. This is where I say simple is better. So the best coaches on course are going to do a practice like this that looks really easy, but they'll know when to step in and when to give advice and what players to give advice to. So the coaching points are the same. Create width and depth as a team. Then receive on your back foot with your body turned out if you're under no pressure. So the ball comes into you and you check your shoulders, there's no pressure. Turn your body out so that you're facing forward and you can play your next pass forward. Okay. Um, that psychological thing of try to play forward when you can. I have seen someone put a challenge in before that actually worked really well in a game. Um, and he was working on penetration and he put a rule in that if you had a forward pass on and you didn't play it, he would give the other team a free kick. And then what happened within about a minute is everyone was really looking to play the forward passes constantly. Then the skill of the coaches step it in to kind of say, well, these ones are getting cut out. And then it's about them making decisions on when is the right time to play forward and when is it the right time to keep the ball. So quality of weight and pass again. And then this term of up, back, and through. So if this red was playing with, if, I, if this green was playing with the blues, the ball might come up to this player who sets it back for this player to go through. And you can start introducing patterns then to help work on penetration. <clears throat> so we can't penetrate, so we're going to work on creating space. I've narrowed it down a little bit about using whip to penetrate. So that's how we're creating space here. Now. This one is um, a half pitch. You probably need roughly two thirds of the players in the format you work in. So if you work 11 aside, you need probably eight versus seven. If you work seven aside, you probably need at least a four before for this practice to, to work. And all we do is add in two channels at the side of the pitch. So if, there's seven, if you play seven v seven, you would set this up on half a seven v seven pitch, playing four v four. This is adults, half an 11 aside pitch, eight versus seven. That includes the keeper, obviously. Um, and there's two channels at each side. On a full-size pitch, roughly 10 yards. Um, on a smaller pitch, they'd be a lot smaller. Again, they're just for reference. No one is locked into a zone. Okay, so the Reds are trying to score in the big goal in this picture. The Blues are trying to win the ball and score in the three small goals. If you want to progress this and make it more competitive, the goalkeeper would stay in. And you would say, once the Blues have scored three times in the small goals, the team swap ends. 
Um, or you can do this on a time limit. After three minutes, you're going to swap eggs because everyone wants to shoot in a big goal. So think about player engagement. You want to give them the opportunity. Depending on your team, if you want them to be really competitive and psychologically challenged, you can do it. You've got to win the ball and score three times in the little goals. If that takes you 20 minutes and then you last two minutes before the other teams do it, tough, you're swapping again. If you were doing it with younger players and you want to give them lots of opportunities to have a go and try, do it for a time limit. So the first, so the first objective is to penetrate and play into strikers. So talk to the Reds about can we penetrate, can we penetrate and play into strikers? If you can't, so this is your next coaching point. Okay, if you can't do that, can we have a player in each of the wide zones when we're in possession of the ball? This will, by saying and having these reference points of the zones, not that they've got to be there, because also you get rotation of different players doing it this way. By having a player in both zones, they will naturally spread the pitch and they've got five midfielders against three. Okay, and then you can talk to them about move the ball side to side to see if an opportunity comes up for a wide player to either attack the line unopposed or 1v1, or as you start moving the ball side to side, do opportunities to penetrate now come up? So it's when they turn to play that way, can they have the little look at the corner of their eye and see now I can play to the striker and be really clever and fizzy into the striker's feet? The reason why we say penetrate first is, even if you're trying to use a lot of width in your team, if you play centrally, the other team will naturally compact to the centre of the pitch, which then creates even more space for your wide players. So even if a lot of your attacking um, tactics are based on your wide players getting the ball, if you play your first passes central, that will actually create more time for the wide players because the other team will then start to do that. Um, and then the last coaching point is when the ball is in one channel, especially as that player starts to come forward, can the player that was in the other channel come inside and start to attack the far post? Because there's no point me stood right out there in a channel when the ball's crossed. Okay, so it starts to introduce more tactical topics and into this now. Then we go back to a nice and simple one, but you can make this one really complicated. I've done this with seven-year-olds and I've done it with 27-year-olds. So create a square roughly 20, 20, 20 by 20. And this is about using rotation to create space. So a great one for working with your kind of defenders and midfielder, your midfielders and strikers, your midfielders as a unit, uh, or for younger players, just working on rotation in general. So create a square roughly 20 by 20. And the aim is to get end to end 10 times. Again, doesn't have to be continuous. But the rule is you must always have one player in each half. So you'll notice there's a halfway line. And there's no leeway on it. If any point all three players go out, free kick to go a team. So, and you've got your two servers. So basically what happens is they start to rotate naturally. So a blue will drop in here. And then the other one you will hope will start to drop out. Or if the blue drops in here, you can still have two in here as long as there's one up here. So coaching points are, can you penetrate and play forward to the target player? Even if that means missing an area out. So if someone receives it in the bottom area and plays straight through, that's great. <coughs> Then one of the next things you can put in is, and you can put this in as a rule of you must, or you can use can you try to, try to get players to rotate every time the ball goes out to a server. What you might need to do is make it as a rule first, the player that plays out to the server must get into the other half. <laughs> and then someone will come in and take their place. You're forcing the rotation but once they start to get used to it, they will do it naturally. And I promise you now, if you can get any of your teams doing this, that as soon as someone plays into the server, they get out and into the other area, someone comes back into that end, you will get end-to-end -end non-stop because of a little bit of good rotation. What you then need to do is talk to the players about what good rotation looks like because it'll amaze you what will happen is if, if this blue drops out here, this blue will actually run exactly where they were and go stand next to the defender a lot of the time, which I, it baffles me, but a lot of people do it. So if this blue comes out, this player will go and rotate, encourage them to rotate into the space that's left. Then when they're rotating, we want to adjust their body shape. If you're the player coming, if you just played into the server and you're going to get out and into the other area, you've got to adjust your shape, body shape and your run so that you can see the ball at all times. 
because we've all seen that player that inside is running away, the ball gets played to them and they're not looking at it. And the player that comes and drops into the area to receive the ball, always try to encourage them to return and receive on their back foot so they can play forward quickly because they will usually be in space. The other thing is penetration, I've, um, I've talked a lot about is of passing. It can be dribbling and driving into the space as well. So in this practice, if this blue player gets the ball, we can drive into the space or she can drive into the space. But because of this rule of one player has to drop out, someone will hopefully do that. And actually that's just giving yourself solidity in transition. So instead of everyone bombing forward, it is someone clever enough to go, oh, they're driving forward with the ball. I'm gonna to need to drop back in and, and provide some solidity. Okay, so getting there, onto our possession now. I've shared this practice before. It's one of my favorite practices. A normal pitch, this one is split into thirds. Um, again, they're not restricted, but they play a normal game. But if they win the ball, so if the red team win the ball in this top third, it's worth three, and then score, it's worth three goals. If they win it in the middle third and then go and score, it's worth two. If they win it in the bottom third and then go and score, it's worth one. Okay, so, and obviously for the blues, the top end up here would be three points, two points, one point. This encourages them to then high press and try and win the ball high up the pitch. Skill of the coach is when they go a bit silly and they all go up there and they just get played past. It's understanding how and when are we pressing. Um, and then a progression of this practice is to ask them how they're going to do it, first of all. So you don't change the rules yet. Get the players to discuss it. How are you going to win the ball up here? What are you going to do? No matter, I don't care if they're seven or adults, let them have a go at coming up their own tactics, okay? Then to progress the practice further, you can let them pick what area they want to be worth three points. So they might, they might go, do you know what? The opposition are really quick. They're a lot quicker than us. We're gonna sit in a low block and if we're gonna not allow any space for them to play, so we're gonna make our defensive end worth three points, but then we're gonna counter attack really quickly if we can. Let them come up with their own ideas. It's absolutely fine what they do. And this is how to teach players tactics, whether, again, kids or adults, let them come up with their ideas and their tactics and see if it works. So a couple of coaching points you might add in for the Reds. Okay, if you notice the Reds here have dropped off, that's actually to encourage the Blues to play short so then we can press them. If we go and mark them player for player, they might just pump it over the top and then we're not going to get the opportunity to win it in that zone. So press as soon as the ball leaves the goalkeeper's foot. And then you've got to figure out, do you want to go man to man, which is everyone just goes and takes a player really quickly, or do something we call cut the pitch in half. So cut the pitch in half will be this red player. And the ball comes out here. The red player will come up here and angle their run so they can't, the blue can't play across the pitch. Okay, and if the blue can't play across the pitch, it cuts out a lot of their options straight away. Okay. Um, Cut off forward passes with your pressing runs so that they can't play forward. So think about where they're trying to play so your run cuts that off. Ball side and goal side so we can intercept. So ball side means the side of the attacker that the ball is. Goal side is between the ball, um, between the goal and the player. And the goalkeeper needs to be wary of the long passes behind. And I'm going to run a little bit over time um, here, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, Set out the pitch roughly. So this is delaying. This is a really big one. When we see coaches do stuff where the team defending hasn't got as many players, especially if it's kind of 2v1 or 4v2, there has to be some form of recovering defender. Because when we haven't got, when we've got less players, your job of your defender is not to win the ball. Your job is to slow the opposition down so that other players can get back. And there's a great clip of Van Dyke doing this a few years back where he just got in a position to slow the attacker down. So I do a nice simple one, five players at each end, but two will go at a time so they get their rest period. The Reds play the pass into the Blues. One Red can go out and defend, defend. so two Blues will come out. One Red can go out and defend a small goal. The other Red has to do a sprint up through the Blue gate at the end, and then they come back in to defend. So the Blues have probably got five to 10 seconds to really attack. If the other team can, if the Reds can slow them down before they get there, their defender will get back in and then they're 2v2. If the Reds win the ball, they dribble it over the line and they get um, two points. If the Blues score in the goal, it's only worth one. So you're rewarding the Reds higher because it's a, more of a challenge. 
I'd give it uh, three minutes and then swap them over. So the coaching points, nice and simple. If you go all out high press and there's one of you against two of them, most of the time you're going to lose. They'll play around you. Your job is to get as high up the pitch as you can, but then you need to stop because when the point that someone's going to go out of your field of vision. So one person there and one person there, as long as you can see them about turning your head, if they start to go beyond you, you need to drop back. You need to always be able to see both players. When you can see both players, if it's the player right in front of the goal, you need to be in a position to cut out the pass straight into the goal. And as the ball goes to the side, you haven't got to go all the way across. You go across far enough just to cut out their pass into the goal. And then if it goes there, you go sideways. And that's all you're doing is dropping and slowing them down and cutting off the goal. And then your players should get back to help you. So some of this is psychological for the players. Uh, when the, um, so you're just moving side to side, but then once you're recovering, defender comes back in, they can make straight runs and then they can help you defend and give you a better chance. So delaying is a bit psychological about trying to do that. Um, so, uh, oh, great stuff, Andy. Is that the one with the uh, pressing one? About the three, uh, Andy's had some success with them. And it's great, yeah, brilliant. And do you know what? What I love is it's with under sevens. We can teach under sevens tactics by creating these little fun games. And they'll learn and they'll get better and better. And as they get older, they're more prepared for the 11 aside game. Right, a uh, couple, uh, one left, compactness. And on a semi coach, this is one of my favourite things to teach. Some people say it's because I'm boring and I like to be set up and structured defensively before we attack. Um, I probably agree with them, to be honest. Um, but compactness for me is massive. If you're compact, you're so hard to beat. I always, my teams personally, was that we never let the opposition play down the middle. So we, drink, we compact that area up quickly. Um, this is an example of 11 aside. Again, you'd probably need seven versus six for 11 aside, but you break that down to maybe four v four with seven aside. So the red team are trying to score in the big goal. If they can play through the shaded area and score, it's worth three goals. So that's what the red will get extra reward for. Um, the yellow bib player at the end is a target, a server for the reds. So the reds can use that player as an extra, an extra um, to give them the overload. But if the blues win it, they, they need to find that target player as quickly as they can or score in the little goals at the side. Um, if the blues play into the yellow, the yellow plays it straight back into the reds, which adds an extra challenge for the blues because they might be outnumbered as well then. But that's, we never always, we're not always organized during a game. So working out numbers is really important. You can then swap them based on a time limit or once the blues have scored in the little goal or hit the target for a certain amount of times. In terms of coaching compactness, all blues need to be 10 yards apart at all times. That's whip and then the midfield and defenders around 10 yards in front of them. If you added a striker in, there'd be another 10 yards or so in front of them. You might adjust that for eight yards for youngsters. It might be 12 to 15 yards for adults, depending on how quick they are and how athletic they are. So the key to this practice, those two blue midfielders cannot match four midfielders. They can't do that. So the two blue midfielders' job is to cut out passes into the strikers. So when the ball's central, it's obviously quite clear where they are. Um, if you um, want to, if they then play wide, you don't want your midfield to sprint in 20 odd yards out there to try and get it. Your full, if they come forward, your fullback's going to have to deal with it. But what your uh, midfielders need to do is get into a position again to stop them playing into the striker. So the midfielder might just be, when the ball goes wide, making a seven, eight yard run to, out to that player and cutting off their pass into the striker. So that is their job in terms of this practice. Um, back four, always 10 yards apart. But if that wide player comes forward, they've got to go out and deal with it. But then your furthest away player should probably be in line with the far post. If the Reds got the ability to ping the ball 70 yards across the pitch, by the time they do that, that player will be able to get out to them. But what we get sometimes is the left back in the blue, for example, is so worried about their right midfield that they stay really wide and then it creates opportunity for the other team to penetrate. So it's about this back four staying 10 yards apart all the time. And then it's important to be patient and compact rather than coming out of your position to press. Just think about it, you've got to be organised as a team, organised as a team, hard to beat, 
and then win the ball at the right time. Again, you'll notice a lot of these things, it's about changing players psychologically. Instead of just tear around everywhere, just be a bit more clever about things. And that's where our skill as a coach comes in. So that's all the practices. Anyone that wants the practices, just email me on the email address that I sent you the list out on and I will send you all the practices. So a couple of tips. Um, I put this on TikTok. Uh, yeah, I'm 40 years old and I've done a TikTok. Um, so be open-minded on the course. You're going to get challenged. Um, and you can go on it thinking, I'm really good at this, but then that might get challenged as well. And that's okay. But go and learn things from everyone. Take little bits from everyone on the course. We've talked about knowing your players and principles of play. Go on the course with a basic understanding of what your strengths are and what your areas for development are, because then hopefully you'll get more out of it. But as I just said, some of you might think is your strength might get challenged, and that's absolutely fine. And the last one is to network. Network with everyone on that course. Networking is about getting on with everyone, but think about how you are coming across. Are you coming across as someone that thinks they know everything, um, is maybe a bit aggressive or isn't open to conversations, doesn't like being challenged? Or are you going on that course and everyone's thinking, yeah, they know what they're talking about, but actually they're quite open-minded as well. They'll put a bit of work in for everyone. They'll get involved in discussions. They'll see other people's points of view. Because there's a lot of people that go onto this course with aspirations of making it full time in coaching. And actually, and, and a lot of people say, oh, it's, it's about who you know, not what you know. And actually, football is a lot like that. And it is. So people moan about it. But in my, my experience, it's, that's what it's like. So actually, try and build a network of people because they're all going to go, hopefully, somewhere. And then if you've got on well with them, you can either go there with them or at least there'll be someone there that you can then ask for advice from and get tips from yourself so it's really important that networking side of things um in terms of socials we've obviously got webinars every month um you can put um we'll have stuff on on all these social channels which you can follow us on you can email me you can dm me it's no problem i will get back to you any questions chuck in any idea, Rob, when you can apply for them? So just uh, in Kent, they are meant to be releasing at least two, maybe three or four courses in the next uh, week or so. I don't know if every count is the same, um, but I do know that the plan is to roll a lot of courses out this year. Um, but your best bet is asking County FA about that. Although the courses aren't run by County FA anymore, they're run centrally from George's Park. Um, so that is the best I can give you on that, I'm afraid. What I would say is um, when they do come out, try and have like your notifications set on Twitter for the County FA when they release stuff or um, be just be bang on where the, where the information gets released from your County FA because I think the places will go really quickly. Um, but that's the best I can do on that, I'm afraid. Um, right, like I said, thanks for watching, everyone. Hopefully it's useful. Um, this will go on our Facebook page if anyone wants to catch up on it or if you want to tag other people in that you think could watch it. If you've got people from your club that you want to tag in to maybe get people to watch it as well as the last webinar is on there about how to coach under six, sevens and eights players. Um, and then we've got another webinar coming up next month uh, so keep an eye out for that. And yeah, thank you very much, guys. Anything you need, uh, please drop me a message or an email. Take care. Bye.